Greetings to everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion. Uh, I'm very happy that you, uh, well, that there is such a, a great interest for, for this topic. Um, <clears throat> the reason that we have, uh, we are showing this film now here in Geneva is to mark the 100th um, year since the first use of chemical weapons in Ypres. And during the last few weeks, there were a couple of, well, actually quite a few screening sessions in Ypres, uh, where the weapons were first used, in Strasbourg, as well as in Berlin. And one of the people featured in this film, Paul Walker, the director of Green Cross's uh, Environmental Security and Sustainability Program, who's featured in quite a few parts of this film, uh, has participated in all of these sessions because of dates. We uh, cannot have him with us this evening, but uh, he will come back later this year, and we hope that we'll be able to, to organize another event with him. Uh, for three years, we have worked with Arte in order to prepare this film as consultants, uh, and of course, uh, helping them in bringing a number of the, the speakers, including one of our stars here, Jean-Pascal Zanders, uh, who, who spoke before the, the film, uh, who was teaching here uh, last year, it was the last semester, and I'm really delighted that uh, that uh, Peter Zenders from the OPCW, the OPCW based in The Hague, has been able to, to be with us, so he just arrived a few hours ago. Uh, welcome, Peter. And of course, Ambassador Sergei Bansanov, who is the director of Pogwash here in Geneva, an organization that is looking after, uh, well, reducing global security threats, and Ambassador Batsanov, formerly Soviet and then Russian ambassador, is one of the people who helped uh, get the Chemical Weapons Convention and then the OPCW uh, in place uh, back in 1993. And in 1993 is also the year when Green Cross, Green Cross International was set up, of course, by uh, President Mikhail Gorbachev, and it's also the year when the legacy program, Legacy of the Cold War, was started by Mikhail Gorbachev, Paul Walker, and a number of, uh, of people that have been running this program ever since. Um, <clears throat> a number of, of, uh, of points, I will not go over the, the various aspects. I think this movie not only shows the very technical, uh, diplomatic, and, and political difficulties that are linked to, to the chemical weapons destruction process, uh, but also it shows the very human side. And uh, that's one of the very uh, good features of this film and one of the points that was noted by, uh, by Dan Daniel Fix, who is with us tonight as well, who was with the OPCW in The Hague until December and now is looking after uh, the Biological Weapons Convention for the United Nations here in Geneva. So w welcome, Dan. Um, on this, uh, I would like to, to open the panel discussion, and I would like to ask our panelists to be very brief in the opening remarks. At a 20 to 8, we will be closing the session. So brief opening remarks, and then we'll, we'll leave it uh, afterwards for the, the Q&A session to elaborate on the different points. And, uh, as a, a representative from the OPCW, Peter, I would like you to, to start. Here we go. Thank you, Adam, and uh, welcome everybody here. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk with you. Um, I'll be quite brief, because I think you heard from a lot of my colleagues in the film uh, to cast an institutional view um, of what it is that we do and why what we've done has been successful, and perhaps give you a sense of what the challenges ahead are in, in less than five minutes or so. So, as we heard from the Director General, I mean, we are now um, at 87% of all declared chemical weapons having been verified as destroyed by the OPCW. Um, we have a total of about 70,000 metric tons of declared chemical weapons we're working on. We have 190 member states, we're near universal, and uh, of those, there are eight possessor states that have been declared. Uh, most, most of these countries' arsenals have already been disposed of, and the US and Russia obviously have a much larger task given the size of their arsenals, but work is proceeding apace. Um, I would just say perhaps on, uh, to supplement the information we had on universality in the film, uh, true, there are six non-state parties, to, um, countries that haven't succeeded the convention yet. Myanmar was overlooked in that film. But we've made quite a bit of progress. Both Angola and Myanmar's parliaments have approved 
uh, accession to the treaty. Myanmar is, in fact, a signatory, so we're hoping that they will formally join the convention very, very shortly. South Sudan has no reason to be outside of the treaty other than a question of capacity of its government. Um, in fact, I was in Monday, uh, on Monday in Brussels having a conversation with the ambassador about this issue, so we're hoping that they will be able to uh, join the treaty very soon themselves. Indian Egypt, uh, sorry, Egypt and Israel are bound up in a regional security dynamic. I won't go into details here, perhaps for the discussion. And North Korea, of course, we've not had much engagement from them at all. Um, how the C why, why is the CWC so, so successful? I mean, I certainly would you know, venture the opinion that it's arguably the most successful multilateral disarmament non-proliferation treaty in the history of such negotiations. And the reason I would say that is there are perhaps, you know, a, a, there's a very unique combination of provisions that the CWC has, which are referred to here. Um, first of all, you know, we do have other treaties that have some of the features that we have. For example, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is an excellent treaty with an excellent verification regime, but it has the disadvantage of not actually having entered into force, whereas we have, of course. Um, the Chemical Weapons Convention has no haves and have-nots. We don't have any provision for chemical weapon states. It's a non-discriminatory treaty. All member states are bound by the same obligations and have access to the same rights without uh, any, any favoritism or preferential treatment unlike the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, perhaps in the relation to nuclear weapon states. And unlike the Biological Weapons Convention, which also bans an entire class of weapons of mass destruction, we, in fact, have a verification regime, um, perhaps the gold standard, as current circumstances uh, suggest. So this, these, this unique combination of provisions has helped us build a lot of transparency and confidence among member states, um, referred to also in the film as the important role played by industry. It's very important for industry to be satisfied that this commercial secrets can be safeguarded in the course of inspections. Likewise, countries want to make sure that their national security is not compromised in the course of uh, inspections and monitoring exercises. And for this, we have particular provisions to, to allow for that. Um, one thing that's not mentioned there, of course, also, what makes our verification regime particularly, uh, particularly good is that there is a provision for challenge inspections. In other words, a state party that might suspect that another state party is undertaking covert illegal activity or being in non-compliance with the convention can ask for the OPCW to issue a challenge inspection at short notice. Now, that hasn't happened in the 18-year history of the OPCW. Some suggest the political stakes are too high for a country to issue such a process. The other view, which I perhaps share, is that the, the provision of a challenge inspection, in fact, acts as the de deterrent. And before we would come to that, there is a consultation process. I won't go into that here, but we do have this provision, which is quite unique. Um, in terms of where the CWC came out, I mean, I mentioned before that it is probably the most successful treaty in disarmament history. I mean, the circumstances were obviously propitious for negotiating such a comprehensive treaty in the 1980s. We had obviously the background of the Iran-Iraq war focusing negotiators' minds. We had the history or the ex exposure of the fact that a lot of companies, including Western companies, were whether wittingly or unwittingly exporting materials and technologies that were contributing to the proliferation of chemical weapons in the Middle East in particular. Um, we had obviously the circumstances of the end of the Cold War, which allowed a new spirit of cooperation between the superpowers, uh, in particular to obtain a non-discriminatory treaty, a complete ban, rather than having uh, some permission for some stockpiles to exist. And of course, you know, by the 1980s, there was dwindling battlefield utility for chemical weapons, which was also an important factor. So certainly, we were the victims of good circumstances, historically, in negotiating such a treaty. But the bottom line is that this political will is something that we've been able to you know, bottle in some ways. And the best evidence of that, of course, was a Syria mission. Now, the Syria mission was an extraordinary success in the sense that we never before had to undertake such a mission, disarming a country of a major WMD arsenal in such circumstances, in such compressed time frames. And the way we were able to do that was simply because we had that strong international consensus against chemical weapons that allowed us to negotiate the CWC, backing us up. 
It was an extraordinary international effort. More than 30 countries contributed both in-kind and financial support to get this mission underway. Um, if there are, I mean, we, the most important thing to remember, though, of course, is that when uh, we had this opportunity to uh, remove and destroy chemical weapons from Syria, we didn't need to set up a specially mandated ad hoc international arrangement. We had the CWC in place and was able to slip into action straight away. By the same token, because of the political will against, or the consensus against chemical weapons, we were able to do things that not only proved the resilience of the convention, but also showed us flexibility. For example, as was stated by the Director General in the film, it's the responsibility of a possessor state, at their own cost, to get rid of its arsenals um, once they accede to the convention. Now, we made an exception in the case of Syria, given the circumstances and at Syria's request, to remove those weapons and destroy them elsewhere. Um, secondly, we also had um, a lot of innovation um, that came to play in the course of this mission. Um, when we couldn't get a land-based destruction solution agreed among our states' parties, we came up with you know, American assistance uh, I'm coming to the fore here with a sea-based solution in the shape of the Cape Ray tried and tested neutralization technologies that were um, discussed here in the film were mounted aboard the Cape Ray and the lion's share of the most dangerous precursor chemicals and sulfur muscle were destroyed on board that ship. The other thing that was quite unique about this mission, a third factor worth considering for any lessons learned, is that we had you know, the, the embryo of, of you know, public-private partnership in the form of uh, commercial entities coming into play in some of the destruction. We put to tender uh, the destruction of some of the chemicals that were widely traded commercially and uh, handled in commercial facilities. And uh, two companies, one in Finland, one in the US, came to the fore in that respect and uh, um, helped out. So this is a good example of how we might be able to address such multilateral challenges, engaging the private sector increasingly. And certainly now, um, chemical industry did play an important role in setting up a verification regime for the convention, but now we need to think about what we do next with chemical industry. So I might just leave it there. What I will mention is I wouldn't be quite as downbeat as perhaps the film in terms of how we're addressing challenges ahead. There are numerous challenges, of course. Globalization of the chemical industry will challenge how we do verification and monitoring um, um, inspections in, in the future. Um, new technologies will stretch how we look at implementing the Chemical Weapons Convention down the track. And, and likewise, the threat of non-state actors, for which treaties such as the CWC, NPT, and others are ill-equipped because they were negotiated before this was a major concern. But nonetheless, um, I'll leave it there. I mean, but what we are thinking about in the transition and what we need to defend against is we need to avoid becoming what I call a non-proliferation victim of our disarmament success. And that is something that we're very focused on as we transition in the post-destruction phase. Uh, th thank you, Peter. You talked about the importance of the private sector, uh, civil society. There are, there are 150 civil society organizations that are working now with the OPCW, and, and uh, that's work that is being coordinated by, by Paul Walker uh, in The Hague. Well, Paul Walker is based in Washington, but this work is taking place in The Hague. Jean-Pascal. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to follow up on uh, Peter's introductory uh, remarks and focusing on the future of uh, the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. I think um, in uh, disarmament, uh, I always like to think there is a backward dimension and there is a future dimension. The backward dimension is eliminating the history, destroying the weapons, but once that has been achieved, then the task of disarmament is actually to prevent future armament or rearmament with uh, the prohibited uh, weapons. This is going to be uh, quite a, a challenge uh, for the international community because preventing something from happening is quite abstract compared to destroying the munitions. And for destroying munitions, uh, there's always going to be money available, there are going to be inspectors available. But for the OPCW as an organization, uh, my fear is a bit that uh, states view it as just one other international bureaucracy which uh, can be downsized. However, in my mind, the OPCW is a security organization. It's an organization that needs to have uh, particular capacities to act whenever it is needed. Uh, the day 
that the OPCW cannot repeat something like we have seen over the past two years in uh, Syria is the day that this organization will factually die off uh, for the future. So how does it retain uh, capacity? How does it retain redundancy to be able to meet not just one, but perhaps two or three contingencies at the same time? Some of the challenges uh, right now we are already seeing in uh, Syria uh, happening, particularly with um, increasing evidence of uh, use of toxic agents by non-state actors. And in particular, uh, one scenario that uh, has become a reality, and perhaps a few months ago or half a year ago, I would have thought, well, that's like, you know, uh, something for Hollywood or so to do. But just imagine a situation uh, where you have one non-state actor, an insurgent grouping, a terrorist organization, using toxic chemicals against another non-state actor on the territory of a state party that's not under the control of the government. Now, how does one conduct an investigation under such a situation? How does the international community act in such a situation? Uh, today, it's probably more of a reality, as I've said, uh, than uh, in the past. The other thing, uh, which uh, a little bit we're already seeing uh, happening in The Hague at the OPCW is, and it illustrates uh, the type of development that um, I kind of uh, fear, is even with uh, Syria, there are already calls to return to business as usual. The chemicals have been uh, removed, but there are still quite a few uh, challenges uh, out there. At the same time, it's uh, the other question uh, that needs to be addressed is when and under which uh, circumstances Syria can become a normal state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Right now, there's part coercive disarmament, there's part multilateral disarmament uh, going on there. So uh, there too is uh, going to be quite a, an issue. But can, can the OPCW return to business uh, as usual? I mean, you know, uh, we all talk about the successes of the OPCW, of the CWC, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, it uh, got for its uh, work uh, and so forth. But come to think of it, I mean, uh, it was said in the film, Peter has uh, mentioned it. Take the Biological and Toxin Weapons uh, Convention, okay? Fewer states parties, uh, 171 if my memory serves right uh, today. Uh, there are, there is no verification. However, since the entry into force of the convention in 1975, now 40 years ago, Fewer than 100 people were killed through deliberate disease, toxins and uh, pathogens. That means that, relatively speaking, the treaty is successful. The Chemical Weapons Convention has entered into force in 1997, and now there are probably close to 2,000 dead already, including the fact that the war is taking place, chemical weapons use is taking place on the territory of a state party. This is not something the international community can take lightly. It's not something for which you can return to business as uh, normal. And the final point I uh, would like uh, to make uh, concerns the Middle East zone free of non-conventional weapons. And if you come to think of it, we saw some uh, images uh, from Vietnam. Uh, unfortunately, the images we saw were concerned the use of napalm. Uh, bombing. However, uh, Vietnam was also the case of uh, intensive use of tear gas, uh, both in city wars, city combat, and in tunnel wars against uh, the Viet Cong, but most importantly, the use of Agent Orange and other herbicides and anti-plant agents, which is a type of warfare that's not mentioned in the Chemical Weapons Convention. However, the point I uh, want to make uh, with regard to the Middle East is that with the exception of uh, Vietnam, Indochina in uh, the 1960s, essentially, up to 1971, all major cases of chemical warfare since the Second World War have taken place in the Middle East. This is the region where the urgency 
for chemical weapons disarmament is probably the, gra the greatest. Everything is focused on nuclear weapons. Everything is focused on the schism between the Arabs and Israel because of the nuclear weapon issue. However, I think it's also important, particularly for the mindset in the region, to realize that in the case of chemical weapons, Israel was never involved in that. It was always Arabs against each other. Uh, Muslim communities against each other, and something quite new in the history of chemical warfare, uh, namely governments targeting their own population. This is a, a situation we've seen with uh, Halabja in Iraq, 1988, and then the one thing that was not mentioned, of course, the campaign, the chemical warfare campaign against the, Tur uh, the Kurds fleeing into Turkey and so on after the war with uh, Iran had uh, ended. And uh, today in Syria, uh, the use of uh, the sarin in uh, Ghouta in August 2013, the use of the chlorine is against the own population. Most likely purpose is uh, to terrorize the people. So what I want to say is that, uh, yes, we have come a very, very long way, particularly since uh, the First World War. However, at uh, the same time, we cannot and we should not imagine uh, that the task is uh, complete. I think we still have uh, many, many years of hard work before us, and it's going to be very difficult because uh, there is no funding for civil society, there is no funding for academic uh, research available for that, yet some of the most fundamental work behind the scenes still needs to be done and the pressure needs to be kept up. Uh, to governments so that they fulfill their obligations, not just yesterday and today, but also tomorrow. Thank you. Jean-Pascal, thank you. Thank you for, for raising the situation in Vietnam and Agent Orange use. This is also uh, a place where Green Cross is present, helping the local population deal, well, living in a, a, a polluted, toxically uh, contaminated environment. We're there on the ground, and most of this work is financed through money raised in Switzerland from individuals that sign up and, and become members of our organization, Green Cross Switzerland. Uh, so, so thank you for raising this. You also talked about Syria, the situation in Syria. And uh, that's a situation that required cooperation between the United States and, and Russia. And I, I uh, thinking back of what was said by Joe Biden during the film, he talked about millions of tons of chemical weapons in Russia. I think that was a little bit of a, an exaggeration. Uh, Sergei, uh, could you perhaps provide some corrective uh, <laughs> words about this situation and, and also provide a little wrap-up on this uh, opening uh, discussion? Uh, thank you, Adam. In fact, uh, I think I have re relatively little to add because, uh, let's say, first the film, uh, some individuals who were speaking on the screen, some of them uh, continued here, uh, like my neighbor to the right. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot has been said, um, little to add. Maybe I would add a, a bit. Um, one thing, in my view, is that, uh, important thing, is that um, at the very end of the Cold War, and actually, um, a sudden acceleration at negotiations started um, not when the Soviet Union uh, was uh, dissolved or when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. The real acceleration started in 86. And uh, that's when I think, little by little, uh, after uh, about um, 13 or 14 years of negotiations, countries were beginning slowly to understand that they did not need chemical weapons anymore. Not everyone at the same time, uh, not uh, unambiguously, but that's when uh, this very important change of general attitude uh, started to manifest itself. Why I am saying that? Because uh, in a way, uh, chemical weapons negotiations, I think, offers a number of important lessons for a much bigger, much more challenging task 
and that is of uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not calling to uh, just copy the process, copy, uh, let's say, approaches. That's impossible. That would be absolutely counterproductive. But just as uh, in nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon states are saying that, well, we need this some reliance, uh, some on nuclear factor, some nuclear deterrence. The same arguments were flying about uh, in the chemical weapons negotiations. And it was uh, due to gradual, gradually growing understanding, uh, in particular among uh, the militaries of various participating uh, countries, uh, asking questions, answering questions, going back home uh, to their respective bunkers and thinking, well, indeed, how would we uh, use them if necessary? that uh, started uh, the erosion of this uh, tendency to keep uh, some small chemical deterrent or chemical weapon deterrent. There were proposals about uh, keeping uh, security stockpiles uh, in, uh, during negotiations, uh, coming primarily from uh, the US and France. At the end of the day, they uh, kind of uh, disappeared, were taken away. Uh, when and why that happened, and, and what really manifested the kind of political and military death of chemical weapons for most of the countries, I think the agreement to stop their production. Uh, it was one of the issues which uh, kind of continued to be on the table. Uh, it was addressed in a variety of ways. Uh, the United States finally agreed to stop production uh, in the bilateral context with the Soviet Union. It was uh, 1991. And at that time, at least to me, it became clear that um, the chemical weapons were doomed and the convention would materialize maybe one year later, maybe one year earlier, but uh, it's very possible to do that. Um, Another point, um, it was mentioned uh, already, and I am a bit afraid of uh, being repetitive, that the convention was so successful because it's non discriminatory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would uh, highlight maybe two additional elements. One is uh, that it is a very democratic instrument, maybe because of the time when it was uh, born even comparing to the CTBT, which is not entering into force. Uh, in the Chemical Weapons Convention, no country has a kind of a veto on the entry into force. This was something that had been discussed long time, long time, and at the end, while there was an understanding uh, in general that participation of certain countries was vital, or ratification by certain countries was vital, we would rather go to have uh, a very high or relatively high number of ratifications needed for the entry into force, but we, have, we would have no list at all of those countries without whom it will never enter into force. So no US, no Russia, no China, no anybody on that list. And uh, while uh, Senator Biden there was referring to Russia uh, in the ratification debate in the US, the, in fact, the question was wider. Because if the US uh, were not to ratify the convention, the convention at that time was slated to enter into force at the time of uh, that debate in just a couple of days or so, or maybe a week. And the United States would have lost all the possibility, or much of the possibility, to influence the kind of formation and the building of the OPCW. Uh, it is also very democratic in its verification regime. Uh, I am glad that P Peter reminded about the existence of challenge. And this is what, by the way, the film was not uh, actually mentioning of challenge inspection. Uh, the provisions are very democratic. Uh, the convention uses the so-called red light concept, which allows 
a huge majority of the Executive Council uh, to block the inspection, uh, the challenge inspection, uh, in a very short period of time after it was uh, requested. And if that majority was not created, then the uh, inspection goes forward. By contrast, in the CTBT, you need to have a majority to vote for an inspection and after a certain time. Now, why, uh, and I was very keenly involved in negotiations on uh, this uh, red light concept. Why so? Because we all know there are more important countries, uh, more influential countries and less influential countries. More influential countries can build coalitions. Uh, so, they can make sure that if a challenge inspection is against their interest and they have time and, uh, let's say, opportunity to build a coalition and uh, the inspection would depend on that, they would do it. In the Chemical Weapons Convention, it is not possible. And it was done on purpose. So I'm, I, I'm glad that uh, it's like that. Uh, finally, about uh, Syria. Ah, no, there was one more thing that I wanted to mention about international, uh, about uh, CW, COPCW. Uh, recently, I think Ashe did together with uh, WTO and somebody else uh, prepared a study of international organizations, how they work, how effective they work, and so on and so forth. I looked a little bit uh, at that study, and I found one thing uh, which, in my view, was fundamental missing. Because the success of international organization and it, the way it looks, the way it is, depends on uh, several uh, lines of interaction and several balances. It's what's happening in the secretariat, how the secretariat is organized. It's how and to what extent member states can use the organization to interact and influence the secretariat. And finally, how the secretariat interacts with member states and their organs. In this sense, I think OPCW is also very uh, exemplary, not without problems. Okay, I'm uh, coming under pressure to shut up. Um, and um, I'll do that. Thank you. I am asking about the Russian, the, uh, the uh, Syrian uh, chemical weapons uh, that has been destructed and on the Cape Ray after the destruction. Where, where this, uh, uh, the residue of this the destruction, where it uh, has been sent to where? And uh, the last point that uh, in order to uh, make the proliferation of chemical weapons to stop, we have to also, by the same concept, challenge and inspection, which should also go to the nuclear weapons because as, as you know, all of us know that they consider chemical weapons as the nuclear palm of the poor man. Thank you. Uh, the one topic that came out in the movie and also in your uh, uh, speeches now was uh, the phenomenon of non-state actors. And we have heard how this wasn't really a concern when the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention was negotiated, etc. If there is any method th um, through which uh, the conduct of non-state entities uh, is regulated, it would be sort of an indirect domestic law approach. Uh, so my question is, you know, in today's world, in today's international law, does it mean that um, the prohibition on, on, on use of chemical weapons only applies to states? Are non-state entities free to use chemical weapons? Geneva Protocol, Geneva Declaration, Geneva Treaty, Geneva Convention is very important because, and don't forget that Geneva is also trademarked. Geneva Conventions, it's synonym of ICRC but not IFRC. And uh, I have to my questions. The humanitarian dimension on, for example, uh, the OPCW, uh, yes, as the panelist uh, raised the usefulness of private sector on, on 
plan action on the field, and the moderator raised the collaboration with civil society and non-governmental organizations, but humanitarian dimension it should be incorporated for your organizations. And uh, uh, second and last po uh, uh, point I want to raise, uh, landmines from World Convention, it is also administrated by a humanitarian foundation, which is Swiss Foundation. Another framework convention with cluster munitions. It is also a conven framework conventions and on behalf of humanitarian actions. But uh, this is uh, my question is on your organization and this Swiss foundation who administered those two framework conventions, landmines and cluster munitions. You are based in The Hague. You are uh, maybe, I don't know if you are part of the UN system or no. Thank you. Well, I'll go chronologically. Um, so in terms of the purely mechanical question in relation to what's happening with what was destroyed aboard the Cape Ray, as Paul Walker mentioned, um, of the 1,300 metric tons declared by Syria of chemical agent, um, all of it was removed with the exception of about 300 tons, I think, of isopropanol, Daniel, which was destroyed in country. Everything else was destroyed outside of Syria. Of those almost 1,000 metric tons, outside of isopropanol, 600 metric tons were sulfur mustard, so a unitary chemical weapon, one that's ready to go, basically. And the other one was um, methanol difluoride, and DF, I think, is the, is the acronym, which is the main precursor for sarin. These were the most dangerous chemicals, category one chemicals from the arsenal. They were destroyed aboard the Cape Ray through the use of uh, hydrolysis, a neutralization technique with these two so-called field deployable systems that were uh, manufactured in Maryland in the United States. Um, now, what that does is basically, in layman's terms, because you know, I have a PhD in Russian literature, so I don't have much science behind me myself, but it basically, you know, through a, a caustic solution, neutralizes it by you know, increasing the volume of it. So Paul Walker mentioned 6,000 tons of effluent arose from that. Um, I'm not sure if that figure is correct. I know it's, it's, it's at least a factor of 10 is supposed to be roughly. Now, that effluent um, is, you know, it's toxic, like a toxic chemical is, but, you know, obviously just a fraction of the toxicity of what it was previously. Um, and uh, could be, uh, was then uh, shipped to, I think, three facilities, um, to Germany, uh, a facility in Münster in Germany, um, was disposing it in a government facility, um, other effluent was, is being destroyed in Finland and in the United States. Menexim in the UK was not doing that, that was doing a different toxic chemical. So those effluents are being disposed of there um, under commercial arrangements. And so, in fact, when we say that 98% of serious chemical weapons arsenal has been destroyed, we don't usually include the effluents because they're not part of that figure. Um, in relation to the good example that the chemical uh, uh, disarmament process sets for nuclear, well, I couldn't agree more. This is one thing I've been thinking about. How do we draw, what lessons do we draw from the experience of global chemical disarmament for what we might be able to do in nuclear? Now, that's well beyond my, my mandate. I don't want to get into trouble as an international civil servant. What I will say, though, of course, is I mentioned that the extraordinary political will we had to get rid of chemical weapons. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if we're at that step, that first step on the nuclear side. Uh, nonetheless, of course, a lot of uh, efforts to um, uh, draw up a nuclear weapons convention by the civil society. And you have drawn extensively on you know, what we've done in the CWC context. In relation to non-state actors, um, well, certainly, I mean, uh, um, domestic law is uh, vital here in terms of treating terrorism as a security issue. Um, the suggestion of non-state actors because they're not parties to the convention are free to use chemical weapons. I mean, well, I mean, I don't know of too many terrorist groups that abide by international law. The fact of the matter is that they aren't subject to the same disincentives and, and you know, techniques of dissuasion that states are, of course. They not only want to acquire chemical weapons, they want to use them in order to create havoc and, and kill. There's no, there's no strategic factor that we as states can use to dissuade them. International law certainly is not persuasive in that respect. So what we need to do, of course, under the convention, we nonetheless do have extensive assistance and protection measures. It's one of the four pillars of, of, of the Chemical Weapons Convention, as Sergei mentioned, you know, or um, uh, Jean Pascal. I mean, it's disarmament is more than just getting rid of weapons. It's a holistic venture to make sure they don't, um, uh, uh, those weapons don't re-emerge in any form whatsoever. Um, 
the other thing we need to focus on is, of course, supply side measures. I mean, uh, and this is something we're exploring the, in the chemical weapons con context now, but I'd, I'd rather, in the CWC context now, but I won't go into detail here. Um, in terms of the humanitarian aspects of what it is that we do, well, um, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. What I can say is that uh, I imagine that a lot of international humanitarian agencies were probably watching what we were doing with the joint mission arrangement to get access to the Syrian chemical weapons sites and get kit out with some envy, given the, 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 the scale of the humanitarian disaster in Syria. Um, nonetheless, uh, wait a second, where are we? Um, you know, we, we, we do, there are humanitarian aspects under the Chemical Weapons Convention which cover victims' assistance, but of course that requires a request by a state party to come and help victims, which doesn't always work, especially for the scenarios that Jean Pascal has mapped out in terms of uh, states' parties not be able to govern their space and the activities of non-state actors. But I'll leave it there and pass it to my colleagues. So. I'd like to very, very quick closing comments, and then we will stay around to continue the discussion uh, but the session has to, to end in a few minutes, right? That's right. <laughs> Jean-Pascal. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, very quickly, let me first comment on Geneva Protocol. Uh, I mean, Geneva Protocol uh, bans use in war today uh, any type of uh, armed uh, conflict of asphyxiating gases uh, as well as uh, biological weapons. And I think it was uh, primarily... Uh, the gases that were of concern in the 1920s. Uh, why, why is it called a, a protocol? One must uh, bear in mind that uh, it's actually a document that was uh, agreed in preparation of the disarmament conference of the 1930s uh, go, going on. So uh, it was uh, intended as a temporary uh, kind of international uh, agreement. However, it was realized by the diplomats at the time, without a ban on use, uh, you have no legal foundation to ban the technologies that, can, uh, that are necessary uh, to produce those weapons. And this is a key element to bear in mind for nuclear weapons. As long as you're not going to have a prohibition on the use of nuclear weapons, and so not something like no first use or uh, whatever, but a, a total ban on the use of nuclear weapons, you're never going to come to uh, disarmament. On uh, the terrorism uh, aspect, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, domestic laws are very uh, important. I mean, basically, each uh, state party must transpose the international prohibitions into domestic law to bear in uh, mind that uh, if one uses the general purpose criterion, you can actually preempt any uh, terrorist attack because uh, as soon as an individual has uh, technology uh, in his or her possession, chemical agent, for example, uh, for which it has no, uh, he or she has no legitimate purpose, you can already be arrested. So that's ahead of the crime uh, taking Jean -Pascal. Uh, place. Jean-Pascal, we, we have to... to yeah, uh, but it. just one uh, quick element I want to add uh, to that point. It's uh, also the aspect of extraterritoriality in the application of uh, domestic law. So it's uh, not just any legal or natural person on the territory of a state party subject to the laws, but any national operating on foreign territory is also subject to the law. So in that way, you can uh, cover any transnational aspect. Sergei, yeah. the closing comment. Um, I think the regime, the Chemical Weapons Convention regime, including the OPCW, has shown its um, rather unexpected adaptability to various situations. Yes, it was not uh, envisaged that the regime would be applied to a country uh, like Syria torn uh, apart by a civil war. And by the way, one of the biggest uh, issues that um, both the Americans and the Russians were facing and discuss discussing and trying to understand for themselves. Uh, several days before Kerry Lavrov meeting uh, in uh, September 2013, and actually at that meeting, was whether OPCW was uh, kind of in a position and strong enough to take up this burden. 
And indeed, uh, the well, I think for the for the Russians, the answer was actually um, they themselves answered this question actually before Putin came out with this uh, initiative to first Obama and then to Cameron during the St. Petersburg uh, G20 meeting s several days earlier. But uh, it had to be very seriously discussed, and that's why. Uh, ambassadors from uh, of the two countries from The Hague were called to Geneva to advise the ministers. And finally, the answer was yes, it probably would, and it did. Only that, and this is, I think, a sign of the time, that uh, in order to address new challenges, uh, OPCW uh, should be open uh, to making coalitions with other organ or partnerships with other organizations. Uh, the way it was done uh, when OPCW was addressing uh, Syria, of course, with the United Nations, through the Security Council, because certain things OPCW could not do. And that required uh, somebody else uh, to do that. But otherwise, I think it stood up to the test and to the challenge, and I think this is something very remarkable and a very good lesson for the future. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Jacqueline Cote and to the Graduate Institute, the entire team here for hosting us, and to all the people at Green Cross that made this evening possible. Thank you very much.